All right. Uh, good morning or good afternoon or good evening. I don't know what to say right now, Sandra, but I'm so glad to be here. I'm Tommy Waller. Uh, I'm a Christian Zionist and uh, really good to uh, to be part of this program today. Excited about what we're talking about. I'm Sandra Osterberis, and I'm an Orthodox Jew living in Samaria in the heart of biblical Israel. And uh, today's topic is um, going to be about anti-Semitism. Now, um, you know, I think most of us can understand the fact that anti-Semitism has been around for probably at least, you know, close to 2,000 years. But Christianity itself has a particular role uh, to play and has played a very significant role in anti-Semitism over the centuries. And this is something that we want to tackle today. And, you know, I want to kind of open this, Tommy, um, and kind of share with you and with our viewers how Judaism and how Jews, how we look at some of the issues uh, and what we have seen as ex unbelievable extreme examples of anti-Semitism, uh, touching on places that I think Christians may not have always realized that they were such, you know, sources of anti-Semitism. And I, I'll just give one example now, and that's the Crusades. Um, when I started working with Christians for the first time and, and meeting Christians and, and understanding who they are and, and how they see their own lives and their own faith, I would hear very often this term crusade, you know, bandied about. And very often it's used in a modern sense. You know, people use crusades for talking about all kinds of different programs for outreach and, and bringing Christianity to all kinds of people. Um, but I, I also, uh, became aware that many Christians that I talked to were taught as children or adults, whatever, that the Crusades, the Crusades of the Middle Ages, were, was this wonderful, heroic uh, event uh, on the part of Christians uh, who would travel across Europe to redeem the Holy Land from the infidel. And that they had absolutely no idea of what those Crusaders actually did to Jews along the way. Now, for Jews, the Crusades is almost synonymous with the Holocaust. It's, it's certainly the Holocaust we see as a, a um, modern, uh, um, I don't know, more sophisticated attempt at murdering all the Jews. The Crusaders were not nearly as effective and they were not sophisticated. But definitely a major portion of what the Crusaders were involved with until they got to Israel was murdering Jews. And it was not uncommon for them as they were marching across Europe to go into a particular community that had Jews and then to, uh, to just murder them. I mean, you know, some people have, have read about, um, uh, you know, in the Holocaust, uh, how uh, Nazis rounded up Jews in a particular village, put them into a synagogue, barred the doors, and then burned them all alive in the synagogue. Well, Hitler didn't make that up. Crusaders were doing that long before. Um, in, in, in most gruesome ways, uh, throwing Jews down to the bottom of a well. Um, these were the kinds of things that were going on throughout Europe. Many, many thousands, tens of thousands, perhaps even hundreds of thousands were Jews, were murdered by the Crusaders as they were marching across Europe. And to the extent that there's a special prayer uh, that is said in the synagogue um, every Shabbat, that um, basically prays for the souls of those people uh, who were murdered, um, uh, who were martyred and who were murdered by people who hate Jews. And it's a custom that those pray that prayer is not said at, on a joyous occasion. So if we're in the synagogue for a holiday or we're celebrating um, the new month, we don't say that prayer, except for two months of the year, the months between Passover and the holiday of Shavuot. That, those two months of the year, we say it even during the holiday. And the reason is because that prayer was composed as a result of the Crusades. And that was the time of the Crusades. The Crusades always began after Easter because the, the, the priests and the churches were riling up the, Jew, the, the Christians about how the Jews killed Jesus. Now we're going to go out and kill all the Jews on our way to the Holy Land. And therefore, during that period of time is when most of the Jews were actually murdered during the Crusades. So that, I know I got a little long-winded here, but no, this, it's good. I think, no, you we know, need to hear that. a perspective on something. <clears throat> How do you, Tommy, as a Christian, 
I don't know, what were you taught as a kid about the Crusades and how do you respond to this sort of thing? How do you relate to right. this very problematic part of Christian history? Right, and it is, you know, and I, it, what, it, what is the Christian response is, you know, Tommy, why can't the Jews accept our, our faith? Why, why do they have, what's the problem here, you know? <laughs> And and you're you're obviously talking about you know to somebody or to Christianity as a whole, who doesn't really know this history. You know we again, and you've heard me say this a lot uh, in our discussions. You know we didn't go to church every Sunday to hear about our these kind of things, um, and you did for obvious reasons. Um, you you knew about it. you know our history better than we do. Um, and that's unfortunate. There have been some books in Christianity. There have been some people that have, have gone, but our foundation, obviously, uh, almost, you know, out of the gate, uh, laid a foundation to create, you know, what happened in the 1200s, what happened in, you know, through Germany and then all the way to the Holy Land where there was rape and pillaging and, and murder and, and all kinds of horrible realities uh, that were done in the name of Christianity. You know, they, they, the sad reality is that, you know, even today, if every good Christian is going to, you know, may go to a toy store and they're, and they're still in the, in the, in the store. You can go and, and that they're, they're actually still available today. You can buy the, the helmet and the, and the breastplate and the sword. And you got this, this whole get up and it's got a big cross on the front of it. And uh, I can only imagine um, that you know your your Jew your Jew your family is seeing this little boy running down the street with his sword in his hand and his cross on his his uh, his shield, and you're you're going, oh my gosh, I know what that is. You know he he and his family has no idea. He's just some cool thing. You know he's got the armor of God on, uh, but. But you're going, wow, this child is, you know, this is going to be bad news for us because it, it, it has been bad news for you. Uh, so, but that's, I think that, that unfortunately we don't, we really don't know the consequence of not accepting uh, what, you know, what God is doing with the land of Israel or, or you know, will, and the people of Israel, what he's put his name on, we, we diverted from that. And, and, it, and it really affected us, I think, when, uh, when the, the Jews were in the diaspora. I, I know I'm looking in, uh, in Ezekiel 36, and it says God's name is hallowed when you return and then, and then obviously desecrated when you, and it really is when you, when you were dispersed in the nations, you, you, the God's name was desecrated, and I think that 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 the nations really just didn't know how to take that. It did, really did look like that, you know, that, that God had turned his back on the Jewish people. But God, you know, I think we have to get to that place at some point for us. We have to, in our relationship with God, that God doesn't. He, he's not about changing his mind. He's not about doing something different. What he puts his name on is irrevocable. And uh, so we have to realize that this is a uh, this is this is the reality um, that that I think that that we have to accept our our uh, a new biblical reality. And I thank God because I, I honestly to be to be honest with you, Sandra, I don't know if Tommy Waller could have been different, you know, in the in the 1200s or the 1500s or the whatever because it was. You know, where was our proof? You know, where was this reality of God it, within the Jewish people? Because the, the, the name of God was 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 not there. But now, and I, and I think I would just want to say this to Christianity, we can't go back into that, that hi history and give it any credibility at all. Because right now, God is absolutely showing himself to well, be obviously a keeper of his promise. I mean, like, if I'm understanding you correctly, what you're saying is that in those years, in the Middle Ages, Christians would not have been able to see God's name clearly within the Jewish people. And, and I would dispute that. Um, on the one hand, unless, unless I'm not uh, adequately understanding what you're saying, um, because on the one hand, no question, Jews at that 
point were in misery for the most part. They were persecuted, downtrodden, minority, not the entire time, but a good part of that time with draconian rules set to uh, punish them and, and work against them in, in every right. way. Um, so um, if you're looking for some kind of uh, prosperity doctrine, okay, from the views of a prosperity doctrine, then there's going to be, uh, which is not a Jewish doctrine, this is very much a Christian doctrine, then perhaps people would say, I see a downtrodden people, it must mean that God is cursing them and not blessing them, okay? Hmm. But if they would have to paid attention and bothered to pay attention right. to what's going on in the Jewish community at that time, if they had bothered to visit a synagogue and listen, if they had bothered to go in the streets of a Jewish community and observe, and to see that even if a family is so poor, they're going to take their few pennies and make sure that they are going to have matzah for Passover because that's what God has commanded them. And they will see people getting up early in the morning and going into the synagogue to pray, um, even as they would have to be on the road at 5 a.m. to deliver whatever they were delivering because they were working hard and they were poor uh, uh, laborers. So if they had opened their eyes and looked, they would have seen a very pious people, um, but they were never looking. Yeah, and I, and, I, and I think that for me, it's not about making an excuse, you know, because I, I what I'm, I'm looking at me as a human being, because we're built kind of to go with the flow, you know, we're right. built to go with the momentum. And I've, I, I always just look, I got to look at myself and say, could I or would I? I mean, it's nice to put out my chest and say, you know, okay, I would have been, I would have been different, Sandra. You know me, yeah. I would have been different. But I, those people didn't see what we see today. You right. know, they no, didn't, they didn't that. see that. And and I, and I think that that scares me a little bit because it. First of all, I realized that, you know, for us, we we made horrible mistakes because we didn't. We we walked away from the literal word of God and we changed the. You know, it's kind of like what happened with the Northern Kingdom, you know, when they walked away from God and they walked away from his precepts and where the name of God. There was a lot of and, and we, you know, obviously we did that. We we walked away from the, the word of God and, and where, what he had declared. Um, there was a few people that were, you know, that kept it. You know, thank God, even in the New Testament, Sandra. We have this uh, in Romans chapter three. It says that the Jews kept the oracles of God, <laughs> and that's the and that really I read that and I go they kept the oracles of God. Thank God, the Jews kept the oracles of God, and and you were it, it almost could be read you were keepers of the oracle of oracles of God. You kept and you kept and you and you were keepers. You protected the oracles of God, even when we distorted the oracles of God, you, you made sure that today here, 2020, I can look at a Bible, even though it may have some bias in it because I'm reading, unfortunately, from the English. Sorry. I'm sorry, Sandra. I'm reading, still okay. reading, it, reading it from the English and there's, and it's, it's not going to be as perfect from, you know, in, uh, in the Hebrew as the Hebrew language, but Today, I have a Bible because because the Jews kept the oracles of God and 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 so they never lost their identity, which is also a miracle. You, you mentioned the prosperity gospel, the pros there is, you know, the Jews, where was your prosperity gospel for the last 2000 years, except to believe, honestly believe that this nation was going to be established and, and that the kingdom of God was going to be on earth, you know, that you were you were going to come back to the land and the promises of God uh, were not, uh, you know, could not be taken away. And so th th this is the thing that we should have been doing, but right now it's in our face. It's, you know, and I have, again, I have people all the time. We were talking about this before the, before the show today. I have people all the time calling me and saying the Jews are not really, uh, you know, they're not holy. They're not righteous. They're not doing things like they should be doing. And we, we you know, we want to lay out the dictates of that, of how they should be. And when they come back to the land and it's, you know, the land, obviously I've been to Israel and it's not, you know, it's not the holy land. You know, there's things going on there. That's not, that's not good. There's, you know, it's obviously not what God intended. And, and I just, you know, I, I think you should address that too, because Christianity 
unfortunately believes that they're going to go. I remember, I remember hearing the, uh, the Ethiopians when they, when they were coming back or when different people were coming back, obviously didn't have television or anything, that they were expecting Jerusalem to be, you know, the streets paved with gold and stuff like that. But w- what do you say to Christians that are saying, oh, wow, well, this nation of Israel is not, uh, is not holy. You know, there are parts of Israel. Tel Aviv is, is obviously has a reputation in a lot of different ways of not being a righteous city. What, what is, what's going on with that? I mean, how, how, okay. because there, there is an anti-Semitism that's actually developing within Christianity saying, see what the Jews have done or, or look, they're coming back. They're obviously not the Jewish people or they're not the, you know, this thing. And uh, I, I, have my own deal, but uh, you know what? It, what is it that that you, the religious okay. Jews say about all this? Okay, so first of all, we really believe that God is the judge. It's not for me to judge my fellow human being, and we don't know what's going on inside. And I mean, there's certain things um, we we you know we have the commandments that God gave us, and um, so there's commandments that are very easy to see. You can see if somebody is keeping the Sabbath. Are they, you know, going to synagogue? Are they driving their car to the beach on the Sabbath? And those are very obvious things. But what we don't know and we can't know is what another people, what another person believes. And we don't know if they're good people and if they help others. Uh, and we don't know if they pray. And so really to see the entire person is something that only God could do. And I think it would be good for all of us as human beings. This has nothing to do with Jews or Christians or whoever. All of us as human beings, we do well not to judge people, but just to kind of say, okay, you know, uh, it is important to to comment perhaps on certain activities or phenomena that you would see. In other words, if you see, I mean, I don't know if there's a, a lot of murders going on somewhere. Okay, so definitely, let's talk about murders are terrible. You know, we should be, you know, respecting our fellow man, and, and we have to educate about that. But it's different to say, oh, that whole, you know, because the crime rate is up, that whole nation is a cursed nation. How can we know that? How can we say that? So that's that's part of the answer. The other thing is, I'd like to give this a little perspective, okay? Most Jews in Israel today believe in God. That's a fact. Hmm. Most Jews in Israel today have some. Wait a minute. I thought there was only 15% religious in Israel. I mean, okay. I... So that's, we have to define <laughs> our terms. Because Orthodox Jews, by the way, are probably closer to about 25% of the country. Okay. okay. But what Orthodox means is just that we take our um, responsibility to follow the commandments. Uh, going from the Bible through the various rabbinic interpretations over the centuries. We believe that those commandments apply to us today. So when they sometimes when people talk about the percentage of religious people, as opposed to secular people, they're really not looking at what people believe in. They're looking at people at what they do. And so if there's a person who believes very strongly in God and prays to God on a regular basis, but gets us to his car on the Sabbath and drives to the beach, they will already not be considered religious because in religion, it doesn't mean believing. The word religious within Judaism is taken to believe your practice, okay? And so if you're not quite as strict on your practice as the rabbi say you need to be, you're already taken out of religious. But you're still a God-fearing person. You believe. So there's a very small percentage of Jews in Israel who are atheists or agnostics. Even among the people who are atheists and agnostics, many of those people still feel very strongly connected to the Bible because it is the foundational document of our peoplehood. And it's an important historical document. So that's also something very, very important to remember. We are the only country, there's two things very unique to Israel, okay? We are the only Western country who has more trees at the end of the 20th century than we did at the beginning of the 20th century. We're also the only Western country that has more conversation about God and people that identify themselves as God-fearing at the end of the 20th century than at the beginning of the 20th century. And those are By the way, our, our guys uh, even today are out planting trees today, Sandra, so just to let you oh, know that great. we're... We can we can uh, validate your what so you just said. We're doing so. good on both okay. counts. So, yeah. so that's also something really to don't judge, 
But recognize also that while we are human beings like everybody else and nobody is perfect and everybody has their faults, but to say that the nation of Israel as a whole is a um, atheist or a you know a nation that is not following God's will, I think that's quite a generalization and really is not accurate. Right, and and I think too going back to the the you know the what happened in the 12th century with all the Crusades and even you know throughout and there were little. Uh, even I think uh, with the Byzantines and even before that, it was the same kind of thing. You know, the the Samaritans. You go to the Samaritan village, and they they talk about what the Byzantines did, almost wiping them completely out and the Jews out uh, there. There was Christianity has notoriously felt like for some reason uh, that God was using them to conquer. Uh, you know, in that in that horrible replacement theology that they carried so strongly and 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 what we really have to be careful about about um still today judging that the jews are not you know that i we talked about this last week and i and i like i like to share this with you but when i was looking at ezekiel 36 again hallowing and and it says something after that, hallowing God's name, you return, desecrating God's name, or we actually got it reversed, desecrating God's name when the Jews were living outside of Israel, uh, when Israel didn't exist, and then hallowing God's name when the Jews return. And then it says when they return, God says, I will sprinkle clean water on them. doesn't say anything about Tommy Waller. I don't understand that, but it doesn't say about... And we were talking about that and people are asking me, why don't you believe, you know, in proselytizing or whatever? Because there's a there's a real anti-Semitic approach to the way Christians come into to Israel, I believe, because one thing that we should be doing is what God's doing. You know, I think that we should look at the Bible and say, let's plug into what God's doing. What we didn't do over the last 2000 years in this anti-Semitic uh, acts that we carried out. We really weren't following God's word. God's word you know, says, like, the Jews, yeah, when you return, I, so I'm going to deal with the Jewish this. people. Okay, so let me ask you this, Tommy. Today, it's, it's clear to you and, and to many Christians that I meet that the um, Hebrew Bible is part of your Bible. In fact, it's about 80% yes. of your Bible. Um, and that, the whole Bible. And even the rest of it is pretty Jewish. Right. That's the next thing I was going to say. You know, that you don't have a rejection, even in the New Testament, as far as I understand, of the Hebrew Scriptures. No, so, uh, we, it's valid. I mean, it's the the writers are actually footnoting. Uh, you know, if I could say that, if they're right. they're using the old the the Tanakh and the Torah, the the prophets and Moses as credibility for what they're saying. Right. So there's no question that Christianity and its doctrine, its theology separated itself from Judaism. That I understand, and that's a historical fact. And, and just like you and I don't agree today on some fundamental elements of our faith, that goes all the way back, and that's fine. How did this anti-Semitism happen? This is what I, I'm trying to understand. How did we go from a, a Christianity became a new religion, separated itself from Judaism, accepted certain foundations from Judaism, and then took it in a different direction, legitimate we can disagree but how did that become murderous anti-semitism right well i think the, if i could just say one word leadership uh leadership within the christian community dictated where we were going and what we were doing uh what where we were going where we were going to be because in the you, you mentioned uh i think in our earlier conversations about you know, Constantine and, and all of this thing that happened during that time. And I just want to read here. Uh, there's a there was a uh, an early church church father um, uh, named Christendom, uh, uh, John Christendom. Uh, and he he says this. He says uh, he says uh, the Jews are dogs. They're stiff necked, gluttonous, drunkards. They are beast unfit for work the jews had fallen into a condition lower than the the vilest animals the synagogue is worse than a brothel and a drinking shop it's a den of scoundrels and a temple of demons and the cavern of devils i mean he's just going on and on here current criminal assembly of assassins of our our messiah of christ 
Uh, I hate the Jews because they violate the law. It is the duty of Christians to hate the Jews. Now, this was, I want to tell you, this is written, written, uh, this came, what I'm reading here just came out from the ICEJ, from, uh, from not, this is on their website, the, the International Christian uh, 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 Jerusalem, Embassy of Jerusalem. Embassy of Jerusalem. So this is, a, this is not your, something that come out from a Jewish community. This is, this is something that uh, very sound Christians have written uh, about, um, about what happened in history. Um, so, you know, this foundation, we have, you know, similar statements from origin. And, uh, and then unfortunately, later on, we have uh, statements from Martin Luther, who, you know, we've talked about this, that, that Martin Luther was the, the, you know, reformist. He was going to come in and take all of this, you know, we would hope, I mean, looking back, we would hope that the reformation, the reformation of the church would have taken a whole different um, turn against this horrible reality that we saw in these early church fathers. But then, but then we see where, where um, uh, Luther says that, uh, you know, he's in one of the quotes, again, I'm reading this from the ICEJ uh, website. It says here that uh, what shall we do with this damned and rejected race of Jews? Luther. This is Martin Luther. First, their synagogue should be set on fire. Secondly, their home should be likewise be broken down and destroyed. Thirdly, they should be deprived of their prayer books and Talmuds in which uh, such idolatry, lies, cursing, and blasphemy are taught. Uh, filthy, traveling privileges must be absolutely forbidden to the Jews. If, however, we are afraid that they might harm us personally, then let us settle with them for that which they have exhorted, extorted unseriously from us and, have, and, and after having divided it up fairly, let us drive them out of the country for all time. This is, this is our, you know, this is our good Christian uh, uh, forefathers who we, who we quoted, you know, throughout history and even today celebrating, we, we talked about this before, but we celebrated the 500th anniversary. We celebrated the 500th year anniversary of Luther. Uh, at the same time, we celebrated the 50 year anniversary of the restoration, uh, the Six Day War, the, the celebration of Judea and Samaria and Jerusalem. We call it Jerusalem Day today. Uh, we're, we're at the same time and we're, we're celebrating in 2017. Uh, we're selling, celebrating both of these things. To, what a, what a, what a uh, contrast. Well, you know, like, you know, first of all, I just want to say something as an aside about Martin Luther. I'm not sure that you're, you're even aware of this, um, Tommy, but Martin Luther um, was somebody that, as you said, he began trying to reform Christianity and change it from its Catholic roots, etc. cetera. Um, but uh, one of the things that it seems he was hoping, uh, one of the things that Martin Luther did, in, in, as which became a hallmark of Protestantism, is to encourage Christians to go back and read their Bible, uh, and not just listen to the sermons from the priests. And in fact, part of the Reformation was to translate the Bible into the vernacular, into the various languages that everybody knew, so that a good Christian could pick up his Bible and read it for himself, and, and connect to the Bible himself. And of course, um, it was very important for him also that Christians connect to the Hebrew Bible because that was all part of the one Bible for him. He actually hoped and believed that by making these changes in Christianity, he was going to be successful in evangelizing Jews. And he failed. The Jews were not interested. We, as right. always, have been perfectly happy with our own faith and don't feel that Christianity has something to offer us. And thank, God, thank God that you, result, helped, you held your identity. Thank God. That, as a result of that rejection, Martin Luther turned, in, or let's say revealed, I guess, what was underlying him all along, which was a rabid anti-Semitism. And then you see the expressions that you have quoted. And I have to say that today, when Jews look at this budding uh, relationship between Christians and Jews, the relationship that you and I represent, Tommy, 
But the question that I am asked most often by Jews who are suspicious of this whole thing is, what if we're dealing with another Martin Luther? And so this the example of Martin Luther, which is a 500 years old, still resonates very, very profoundly within the Jewish community. This idea of, well, maybe the, the Christians today are saying they love Israel and they're saying they love the Jewish people and they're doing all sorts of things to kind of create a lovely relationship with the Jewish people, but their ultimate goal is to evangelize the Jews. And what will happen when they realize we are not being evangelized? Will they then turn on us and become the second, you know, a, a, a new uh, Martin Luther? So that's just something right. I want to throw out. Well, I want to say too that, that, that it's, it's sad because the influence, uh, your, your whole you have a nice cup there, Sandra. I like your new your new uh, cup you have there. That's really beautiful. Okay. Uh, that's, that's better than the paper cup you had last last time. I never I, had a paper cup. I'm no, I'm just kidding. Okay. Just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> so that, but the the whole the whole what's what's happened is is that, and I think that this is this is a a, a terrible reality. But as as the missionaries have come into Israel. Um, what are they doing? We're seeing it on we're seeing it on YouTube. Let's just be let's just be totally uh, transparent here. We're, we're seeing things on YouTube right now. Christianity has influenced um, Jews. Uh, there are there is a what they call a, it's funny to me to call different people Jews messianic because I see my friends in Harbor Akah and yourself as very messianic. And and Christianity doesn't. They, well, they, that that's another another dip. Yeah. yeah, right. So I like the, these guys are fiercely messianic uh, people. Um, but but there's people. What 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 I'm noticing, and I'm watching these these YouTube videos from that are, that, that that people are putting out, especially missionary organizations are putting out, and they're fiercely opposing the same things. And and. And, I, and it's it's sad, but it's, they're almost doing the same things that I just read that Martin Luther were talking about. They're talking about how terrible the Orthodox are, how terrible the religion of Jews are, the, the Jewish religion of Judaism and their Talmud and all this other stuff. They're, they're going and they're using the same techniques. And they're, they're, uh, sadly, there are some Jews, not a, not a lot. But there are some Jews that are falling for and walking away and actually in danger of losing their identity again, even today. And I and I and I see it and it just makes me sick that I see these these YouTube videos produced by people that call themselves Jews. And yet they they're they're speaking against uh, the Orthodox community. They're speaking against the rabbis They're speaking against the religion of Judaism. They're speaking against this. And there's a lot of people that be listening to this show. I can tell you, Sandra, right now, there's going to be people listening to this, this program right now that are going to be a little bit kind of like, what, what is Tommy saying here? Why, why is he, why is he saying, but, but this is not an, a new thing. And there were even back in the 15, you know, 1492 in the inquisitions, there were people that actually jumped ship from the Jewish community because of the, 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 the presentation that the Christian community was making. And now we're finding them showing up in different places and, and, uh, in the world that, wow, these guys could have been, you know, they seem like they had traditions, the Jewish traditions and all these kind of things, but why did they, why did they jump ship? Why did they go? They, what did, you know, the Spanish Inquisition, you jumped ship because you didn't want to burn at the stake. Yeah. And actually, for yeah. the first few generations, most of the Jews who did succumb and were baptized into Christianity <laughs> kept their Jewish traditions in private. And even today, I've met a few of these, what we call now today conversos, a few of these people, many, many of them, for 500 years retained their Jewish identity and only married other Jews. Now, wow. they they were afraid to teach their children these Jewish uh, traditions because they were afraid of being found out even after the auto da fe and the the, uh, the stake went away. There was still a, a clear sense of, of difficulty both in Latin America and in Spain and Portugal. Uh, I met a couple that discovered, um, they're from Spain, and they discovered, both of them, that they were descendant of Converso Jews. And there were certain customs that were kept separately. 
they were actually baptized into the church. They, they grew up in the church, but they kept separate customs that their parents didn't even really know how they, what they came from, but they knew that this had to be a secret. Don't tell anybody. Okay. Right, and then right. this couple became, got older and started looking into it. They realized that they were Jews and they came back to Judaism. They left the church, you know, they left that behind and they became Jews. So this is, you know, these, you know, these things happen not because Jews said, oh, I, I'm sick of Judaism. Let me go find Christianity. But because right. they were literally threatened with life or death situations. And it's amazing. Most of the Jews today that are in Israel, they came from North Africa, for example, are descendants of Jews from Spain and Portugal that were given the choice in Spain in 1492 and in Portugal a little bit later, uh, they were given the choice to either convert or leave. And so many of them fled the Iberian Peninsula and went to North Africa and retained their Judaism. So, you know, this really happened. But of course, not everybody is tough. Not everybody is able to withstand the risks. And, and, and so that's, you know, something that we see. But so I, I, I want to think, back, But I, I, I you, you, just to say this. Though, yeah. Well, I just want to, I, I think though that, that, so there's a new method today of stealing identity. You know, what, so, you know, back then, uh, 500 years ago, was there was, there was yeah. a stake. Yeah. Right. So today, now it seems like that there, there's this appeal, uh, yeah. you know, for Jews to not have to be, uh, religious that you can actually accept son, or you can accept Christianity and now you don't have to keep all the Jewish markers anymore. You know, and I call them Jewish markers because because God actually said to the Jewish people, you, you know, this is a sign between me and you. Yeah. This is you are uh, my. Here's a sign. Uh, yeah, but, you know, but, but Tommy, you know, well, that for me, uh, if you accept Christian doctrine, the Jewish markers become irrelevant because you stepped out of Judaism. So right. you can't have both. In other words, the person who decides to avoid the stake right. stays Jewish, not only in practice, but in belief. And, yeah. and that's, that's really critical. And I know you don't agree with me on this necessarily, but <laughs> this, this well, is you know, very, yeah. very central Jews. But I want to go back to something else. When you were talking about Martin Luther and the church fathers from earlier on, and I have to question um, the fact that you are so... Um, have, have educated yourself on all of this uh, so that you now understand who these people were. But how do you or do you, what do you recommend to other Christians to come to terms with this? In other words, these are people that are church fathers. I mean, the very name church fathers means that these are people we're supposed to be, not we, but you Christians are supposed to be revering. You thank them for founding the church or for making important contributions to the development of Christianity. What? How do you then relate to the fact that these were, when it came to the Jews, very evil people, and that probably more than anyone else was responsible for so much of the acts of anti-Semitism that we see in Europe? What do you think you have? To, do you have to renounce these people? How do you come to terms with this? And what do you think Christians should be doing in order to come to terms with this history? Well, I think first of all, educating uh, education is huge because you know it wasn't until i heard these things or saw these things for myself you know we there's so much information out there now uh, we 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 have information it just go to your computer look up the horrors it, on, on really credible obviously sites don't go there's a lot of other we, we talked about this there's a lot of disinformation out there there's a lot of misinformation out there so, but there's some credible sites that are, are really talk about our history in, in really good way. Yad Vashem, you know, the, the website at Yad Vashem, the unbelievable site. There's so much there. I would encourage uh, our, my Christian brothers and sisters to go, go to Yad Vashem website. Uh, you may even find that you, you've got uh, European uh you know ancestors you know or or you may have you know people that were involved because it in the, the jews you know it wasn't there were a lot of other people that misfits you know from the communities that were in there i was uh, even astounded to see that i had uh over 600 wallers you know that were that died in this in the in the holocaust and and obviously waller kind of probably 
went into the Jewish community. I don't know how Waller got into there, but it was interesting to see how, you know what, there could be a personal connection for me for that, for family somewhere down the line. I don't know how, how it could have happened, but we need to learn what the devastation of what Christianity did theologically and then understand, and I, and you know, I've said this many times, I believe that Christianity is a good religion. It's a good, it is a faith that actually gives us connection to Israel, gives us connection to, uh, to the Jewish people. It gives us connection to what God's doing right now. And, and in the world today, we have a, we have, it gives us purpose and, and, uh, and, and this place. And it's, it's sad that we can't, uh, run with this full speed because of the atrocities and the and the horrible horrible um, uh, you know the this this terrible presentation that has been made over the last false and, and, and really in a way that's really disconnected us from the promises of God and so I, I think that the our response first is that we we really need to repent uh, for our, the sins of our forefathers, because I think it's important for us particularly. I know we've had disagreements on this a little bit, but, but also I think that there's some, especially European Jews, that really need to see Christians coming to Israel with uh, a repentant heart, a not boasting of their, you know, their, their Christian faith, but actually saying, you know what, we, we did some things wrong. And, and in order for us to, to change our theology, the only the, the way that we need to correct our doctrine and make it right. First of all, we have to undo what was done in the past and realize that there's a sin against uh, not adhering to and not following specifically what God's plan was from the very beginning. And and I know that we've been given some kind of another uh, another doctrine, but we've got to we've got to go back and correct that place. There really needs to be another reformation a reformation that needs to take place right now so that we can move forward because god is doing something we've never seen this before it's time for christians to get involved drop this anti-semitic uh you know rants and all these other things that we're seeing from pastors like rick wiles and some of these other things that are happening today thousands and hundreds of thousands of people are are signing up for these these pastors that are um, just spewing out anti-Jewish hatred, hatred, hatred. And it's just, and it's got to stop. When is Christianity not like the 30s when we just sit back? Because most of it was indifference, right? Uh, yeah, it was, it, it was people, indifference. You know, like I had a, it was interesting. I was in, uh, my husband and I went on vacation a long weekend a number of years ago to Austria. And we were in Vienna and we took a tour that was sponsored by the municipality uh, of, of like the Jewish history of Vienna, something like that. And it showed us the two different neighborhoods that where Jews lived for centuries. And, and it was it was very interesting. But of course, we came to the issue of the Holocaust and what happened, of course, Austria it was allied with, with Hitler. Hitler marched in and then the Austrians cheered him in the streets of Vienna as he came in. And this woman was clearly very pro-Jewish, very pro-Israel. She was not Jewish, but she was very excited about being able to give this tour. And when the whole tour was over, I went up to her and I and I went up to her and I said, you know, you 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 clearly um, you clearly are very uh, disturbed by your history, by by what what uh, the Nazis were doing in Austria. I said, but how do you come to terms with this? Because I would venture to say that either your father or your grandfather was involved with this. Your father or your grandfather was out there cheering on the Anschluss and saying, Heil Hitler. She got extremely defensive. And she says, wow. well, what do you expect? They put a gun to their heads. They had no choice. And she was like, right, you right, know, and right. like she didn't know what to do with all of this. And of course, I... I you know, I don't think everybody out there on that parade ground had a gun put the, to their head. Um, but it was clearly that this, this disturbed her. The fact that I challenged her in this way. Right, right. Clearly, well, I, I, and I've heard this too, that saying that uh, the Germans, if you go to Germany now, who who has relatives that were, that participated in the Holocaust? Everybody. Are, yeah, everybody. But, but, who, but, but none of them, if you talk to the Germans today, nobody 
nobody will admit that their their parents or their people, you know, they were because there's right. shame. There's such shame involved. Right. We we can't. We've got to get away from the shame, and just c- come back uh, dialogue. Oh, like we're, we're having doing. dialogue right, right now. You and I are having dialogue. Uh, right. This is this is a Christian and a Jewish person dialoguing, who's saying, you know what? There's a day we're moving into a new day, and and I think that that's what I'm excited about. We do have to we do we have to learn from our past. We're not going down right. that direction again. Right. Um, I, I mentioned there are pastors out there right now that are that are giving this anti the, the virus. Sonder, you and you know it. When the when the economy goes down, if there's a plague in the world, who's going to get blamed for that? So that's still going on today in yeah, America. I mean, yeah, it's still going on today. There's like I said, the, the, this Rick Walls. He, there's hundreds of thousands of people. He just thank God. Uh, he got kicked off of YouTube recently. No, but I'll tell you something. I know even in my own family, I would have people listening to this guy and coming to me, asking me questions that they heard from listening to this. And I'm, I, I, we, we talk about this. I hate to even mention his name because I don't want to give him any publicity. But there, the problem is we have got to be fierce, fiercely opposed to these people who are, who are, uh, speaking against the very words of God, very, very, uh, the scriptures, our Bibles. And uh, we have to be fiercely standing against these, these kind, this kind you of know, rhetoric that's many, coming out. I would just throw this question out to the audience. And, you know, I'd love to hear back from, from you. And, and of course, we, we want to encourage all of you to uh, send us emails if you have questions, if you have comments, or, or put your comments on the YouTube uh, or, or whatever. But I'm throwing out this question to all of you. How many of you have sat in church and heard a statement from a pastor that I wouldn't define as overtly anti-Semitism? I would say most pastors are not Rick Wiles. Most of them not out there saying, you know, the Jews are dirty and disgusting and they're responsible for the plague. But on the other hand, how many of you have heard um, have heard uh, pastors say things like, oh, Judaism is very legalistic. They have no spirit. They don't believe in God. You know, that's anti-Semitism because number one, it's false. Um, but number two, it's, it's, um, it's right there setting up a, a situation where you legitimize putting the Jews in a, in, a, in, a, in a bad place. And as a good Christian, you know, we have the ability to say um, they're, they're negative, they're not good or whatever. Um, I would venture to say that many of the pastors who would say statements like that are not don't see themselves as anti-Semites, and I don't think they're out there taking a sword trying to murder any Jews, not at all. But sometimes these very subtle statements can lay the foundation for what will then become real anti-Semitism later on, especially people who are, who are hearing this. But, um, you know, one of the things, though, that um, I, you know, I feel when you talked about repentance, um, here, I think that I agree with you, Tommy. We have to move forward and we have to look to tomorrow. And what we're doing today is building a new relationship. And I think that is probably the most important way for us to be combating anti-Semitism. For Jews and Christians to say to stand together and say anti-Semitism is wrong, and those parts of Christianity that fostered anti-Semitism in the past must be routed out of our theology. And I think that's something Christians need to say. Um, but, at, but at the same time, I think that by the very fact that we are building an alternative relationship that is not based on anti-Semitism, but is based on a common love of God and a common love of, of uh, God's promises to Israel and a recognition of, of Israel as and, and Jews coming back to Israel as a fulfillment of God's promises, that already is in and of itself standing against some of the most fundamental doctrines of anti-Semitism, which actually produce what we call replacement theology. You know, because what is right. replacement theology if not an ultimate anti-Semitism? The Jews are no longer relevant. They are out of God's, you know, favor. We can do whatever we want with them because they're no longer relevant. And, you know, it all really comes down to that. But in terms of repentance, though, I do have a, a slight problem with people owning sins that they never committed okay so for example if christians come up and i've seen this happen i've seen christians come up to let's say children of holocaust survivors 
-hmm. and say, or Holocaust survivors, and say, I want to repent for all that we did to you. And the Holocaust survivors say, but you didn't do it. And right. and I think that there's there's many Holocaust survivors and children of Holocaust survivors, and the Jewish people as a whole are going to say, you you I won't hold you accountable because I know who I do have to hold accountable. I have to call upon those Nazis that did and the Poles and the Ukrainians that helped them. And those are the people I hold accountable. And I am not going to forgive them. I mean, they're gone. Right, 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 right. Uh, right. But you Christians, it's not about mm -hmm. giving you um, forgiveness for that. Right. But if for somebody would come forward and say, you know what? I once believed that Jews were evil and I repent on that. That, yes, because that's your, I, I think that's it's your no. difference. Where, where I would disagree with you, it's funny that, you know, I'm, we're disagreeing on things that you're saying that we don't need. And I'm saying here, I'm, <laughs> I'm supposed to be the Christian and you're supposed to be the Jew. Let's don't get our <laughs> thing uh, me messed up here. Um, but the, the reality is, is that it's kind of what I alluded to before. Um, you know, I, I look in what makes me really sad is that I could have... I could have made the wrong decision in 1938 as well, just like they did. Mm -hmm. And what I, what I need to repent for is that I haven't been, what I want to be as fierce enough as a Christian, as a Bible believer to believe in the promises of God, be excited about the Jewish people returning and to know that I could have been one of those people and that, that I could have been, my forefathers, one of my forefathers, I could have been one of the people that were even in America turning the, the 900 people, 900 Jews back on the boat and agreeing with it and saying something stupid like, you know, we, they're going to take come in. These 900 people are going to take our jobs uh, because the president, you know, if he accepted this vote, that's, that's what people were saying. You know, we know we there wasn't there. Was, where was the outcry? Where was the outcry that the boat was being turned so back? You're talking to? about the St. Louis, the right? The St. Louis, right? All of uh, and, Jewish refugees from Europe who were end up right. sent back to Germany. Where was the protest? Where, 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 where the 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 people, the throngs of Christians that were supposed to be standing up for the word of God and 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 standing against these atrocities? We wasn't, we didn't have it. And would Tommy Waller have been one of those people going out to the to their demanding? How many protesters would it have taken to to make sure that the president accepted that vote? I don't think a lot. I think I think a few hundred or a few thousand people showed up in Washington D.C. It would have changed the whole thing. But we couldn't even get that. We couldn't muster up. A, so for me, in order for us to change the playing field, we have to we have to repent for for the doctrines and theologies that created it in the first place. Oh, that so, I agree. Yeah. So that that's that's yeah. the thing that we that please. You know, when when somebody comes up to you even and say and, and it repents, you know, just go through it. You know, you know, bear <laughs> with us, okay. suffer through it, Sandra. You know, you got to just kind of okay. take it. No, it take comes it. from a very good take place. it like a settler, like the settler <laughs> woman that you are. You know, <laughs> I tell you something. You know what? If you, but what you just said reminds me of something. I just want to leave you with this. What I think is a very interesting thought. As you were talking about putting yourself in the place of what would you have done? What would you have done in 1938? What have you have done in 1940? Neither of us, of course, was alive at that time. So we never had to make these decisions. But I have another what if. You know, if we started our talk tonight about uh, the Crusades and, and, you know, how Christians have been educated as opposed to how Jews understood the Crusades and, and the vast differences there. And I'm looking at what would have happened, okay, if the Crusades had taken what should have been a positive religious zeal, the idea of going in, and conquering the Holy Land, the land of Israel, could have been a very positive one. Imagine if the Crusades would have said, we are the knights in shining armor of Europe. We have the potential to liberate the yes. land of Israel and give it to the Jewish people. What if instead Great of it, sister. And murdering the Jews, they would have said, come with us, we are gonna fight your battle and yeah. the land of Israel will be returned to you. Imagine, what how world history imagine in 1920 if the sam remo conference had created the state at that moment we would have we would and, have had and, no, we would, and the holocaust there have been no jews would that would be have no had jews all murdered. of that so i think it's it very very constructive to to say these things because we are now 
in a different place. And I think it's an opportunity, if I can say it as a Jew, for Christians to look at themselves, look at their faith and look at their history and say, but today we have an opportunity to do it differently. Are we yeah. going to do it differently? And I, and I just want to say to you, Sandra, too, that I'm, I'm raising up children, a lot of them, as you know, uh, and a lot of grandchildren that are going to be even more fierce than me. So we're 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 gonna we're gonna stand and make the stand, and hopefully change the generation ahead. So I'm I'm looking forward to the to that opportunity. Wonderful. It was yeah. great talking to you, Tommy. Yeah, always. I always love these conversations. We're gonna have to get it. We're gonna have to get in our other ones. You know, when we're when we're you know getting more fierce. But this is something we absolutely 100% agree. Uh, have yeah. a lot of agreement on, and uh, we're we're moving, and it is going to be a new day. So I'm, I'm glad to run it with you. Okay. Be well, everybody. All right.